Then, tune and debug. I would like to announce my lack of desire to get into any terminology debates, discussions, or fistfights. Call it what you want. I am tired. Maybe you will say that what we're doing in this seventh step is training-ish. Maybe you'll call, say it's validation-ish. Maybe you'll ask me to put it back to step six or forward to step eight. I don't mind. The point is, it gets its own step because it gets its own data set. You need a separate data set to pull this one off. So you can call it what you like, but uh, please give it a fourth data set. So the things we're going to do, the training-ish thing is tuning, and the validation-ish thing is debugging. And in practice, you can either have this data set pre-saved at the beginning, so you can split into four in the splitting step, or you can take this on the fly out of your training data. So in step seven, you grab some out of training, and now you have a training data set, and you have this data set separate, and then Later, you can recombine them and pull them apart differently if you want to. So it's okay to reuse and mix the data here. So you're going to take it out of the training data, unless there is something very particular and special about how your team wants to do the debugging, in which case it might make sense for you to curate that debugging data set up front and have that fourth one. Who here likes debugging? Actually, I should have asked that question better. Who here likes the idea that someone else will debug? <laughs> Aha! All of us like that one. Now, if you want debugging to be a possibility, you need a debugging data set. So, what will you do? You'll set it aside, and you're going to fit your model in the remaining piece, which I'll refer to as the training data here, but you got the debugging data out of the training data in the first place. Then you will use that for your interim performance check before you go to your validation data set. And you're going to look at the individual instances and see whether you are inspired by what is actually going wrong with those individual instances. Debugging in your training data set, as in the data set where you ran the algorithm, doesn't really give you an honest view of what's going wrong. Because you know that the whole point, right, it's trying to put the boundary or the line as conveniently through the data as it can. It's already contorting itself to your data set. And so you don't really see where it fails. Like debugging that is fine and you get some insight, but the real insight you get is by taking a data set where it didn't have the chance to contort itself and seeing, all right, which ones did it get right? Which ones did it get wrong? Doing a bit of analytics and seeing what's common among the failures, what's common among the successes, and how might I want to adjust my training based on what I'm seeing. So in our wine example, it would be a matter of you look at, you, you run your algorithm in the training set, you go to your debugging set, you have a look at what's common in the failures, and you happen to have the name of the, the bottle of wine also as one of the columns. You didn't use it in training, but you have it. And you're like, hey, look, all the ones where I'm failing, they sound awfully French. Maybe I should have a feature that's got something to do with country of origin. Maybe that would help me. Maybe I don't realize I like French wine or something. And that then inspires me to do some feature engineering and maybe get the information on what was the country of origin of the wine, and that makes me create a new feature, and then I try another approach again with the inclusion of this new feature. So it's really this debugging process where you, the human, the analyst, ends up interactively updating, adjusting, and creating a better solution. So for that, you use a debugging data set. If you skip this step, you lose your explicit debugging strategy. Now you cannot actually look at individual instances. If you look at individual things that went wrong in your training set, well, fundamentally, your entire algorithm's job is to contort the solution insofar as it can, based on the rules of what it is, whether it's a line or a squiggly thing or a bunch of vertical and horizontal lines, whatever it is, it will try as best, according to its nature, 
to contort itself to your training data. So its performance will be pretty good for that training data. If you really want to know about how it fails where it doesn't get this chance for contortion, then you need this other data set. So looking in individual training instances doesn't really give you the full story of what it's getting wrong. It gives you some, but a better insight would be a withheld data set like this one. And you're not allowed to go poke around in the validation data set, you're not allowed to go poke around in the test data set, so you want a sacrificial data set where you are allowed to poke around. You can take that out of your training data or you can have it explicitly preset at the beginning. When is it okay to have no debugging strategy? It's preferable that you do actually interact and put your eyes and brains on the data and think about the solutions that you're making. I'm loath to say that there is a time that it's okay. I mean, today in practice, you should be debugging. But there are folks who have a vision of a hands-free, human-free machine learning of the future. And if you're going for that fully automated thing, then you're trying to skip this step. That's the goal of those projects. So then you wouldn't be manually debugging. But today, the reality is that you should be doing this.